So in this lecture series, we're going to be looking at osmoregulation in fish. Now, this is something you may have to pause the video at certain times to be able to review and look at what some of the images have. Um, I think if you once you look at the whole thing, it might make more sense. But initially, I know this section can be a little confusing. So we're looking at a salmon here and striped bass. Both of these fish are involved in osmoregulation. So it's a balancing act. The physiological system of fish operate in an internal fluid environment that may not match their external fluid environment, meaning the water inside the cells of the fish may not match the concentrations of salts on the water outside the fish. Relative concentrations of water and solutes internally must be maintained with a very narrow limits. This is part of homeostasis. So we can't change the fish, we can only change how the fish is reacting to the environment. The internal environment is influenced by the external environment in the sense of what the fish has to do. This is a clownfish living in salt water, and this is a sunfish living in fresh water. We understand what stresses most of these fish are under. So starting just in general, osmoregulation, it's regulating solute concentrations and balances the gain or loss of water. Cells require a balance between uptake and loss of water. Excretion should make sense. Is it getting rid of um, nitrogen metabolites and other waste products? So this is balancing act, this osmoregulation and excretion. Osmoregulation is based largely on controlled movement of solutes between the internal fluids and the external environment. There's this balancing act that's occurring. The fish in this case is trying to maintain homeostasis, but the external environment could put a lot of pressures on uh, the cell and the stresses on the cell. So starting here, osmotic challenges. Osmoregulators expend energy to control water uptake and loss in a hyperosmotic or hypoosmotic environment. You may want to review the diff diffusion and osmosis lecture series if you're confused on some of this. But let's look at some of these just in general. This is comparing two fish. So we have our freshwater fish and our saltwater fish, our sunfish and our clownfish. The fish salinity, okay, the fish salinity is 14%. That means the salt concentration inside the cells of these fish is 14%. Same thing here on our clownfish, also 14%. What is different though, the fresh water, the in water that it's living in, has 0% salinity, it's fresh water, versus our clownfish has 35% salt water. As a result, salt's being absorbed by the gills, it's gaining water through osmosis. Look at the arrows pointing in. Th these fish, quote, do not drink because water's being pushed in through osmosis. A large amount of dilute urine is evident in freshwater fish. Contrast that to saltwater fish, look at the arrows going in. They're drinking seawater, and what's being ex excreted is salt through the gills, it's losing water through osmosis, and small amount of concentrated salty urine. So this is because of the different environments that these two fish are in. Looking specifically at that freshwater fish, when I say that live in a hypotonic environment. Think back to this slide here, hypotonic. If they did not regulate um, the water intake, these fish would essentially swell up to the point that they could lice or burst their cells. As a result, this water is constantly being gained through osmosis, some salt being absorbed by the gills, they excrete a large amount of dilute urine, a lot of water is being excreted. Simply because the cells, again, have 14%, a uh, higher concentration versus 0%, water is constantly trying to move in. As a result, these fish do not, quote, drink. And this is referring to the water. Freshwater fish constantly take water by osmosis. They lose salts by diffusion and balance it by excreting large amounts of dilute urine. Salts lost by diffusion are replaced in foods and the uptake across their gills. This is an, just a statement of what the previous image shows. So if you found the previous slide better, that's great. If not, this puts it into um, some nice bullets. Freshwater fish challenges, they tend to lose um, ions and they tend to be gaining water. These are a couple of fish species, very common to freshwater. Uh, if you've been in my classroom uh, and you're fortunate enough to work at the panfish lab station, this is a couple of panfish here. They are uh, black crappie here, our yellow perch, and then our sunfish. Now let's look at this marine bony fish or saltwater fish. They live in a hypertonic environment, so water is continuously being lost through osmosis. 
water loss for osmosis because of the concentration. Remember, our fish still has a 14% salinity, but in this case, now our water is 35% salinity. It does drink seawater, and salt is being excreted through the gills, as well as small amounts of concentrated salty urines being lost. Putting that uh, into a couple bolts here, they lose water by osmosis, gain salt by diffusion from food, balance water loss by drinking seawater and excreting salts, and filtration rates are low. Very little urine is excreted. If nothing happened, they would shrivel up. This is the type of environment or stresses that's on them. And this again shows another image here where we're seeing the direction of movement of both water and ions. See, um, drinking seawater, a lot being lost through the gills and the salty urine. Water through the skin is being exchanged also. A couple examples of marine uh, fish, freshwater fish we talked about. This is marine fish. So these are fish that live in marine or saltwater environments. They tend to lose water um, and gain ions. So this is a flounder. Uh, bluefish and false avocar are all examples of marine fish. These have very different challenges than the freshwater fish. And all of these fish were caught in Long Island Sound. Osmotic challenges, again, this kind of shows you again, our osmoregulator is expending that energy to uptake water. As I said, you may have to pause the video and look at everything that's going on here. It makes a great quiz question for being able to compare the stresses of freshwater fish and saltwater fish. So see some commonalities and see some differences. I try to keep everything the same color. Look at the arrows and what's moving in and out of the fish. Those are examples of fish. Now we're looking at specifically sharks. Sharks fit into the category, these particular sharks, um, into what we call osmoconformers. Only um, some of marine animals are um, isoosmotic with the surroundings and do not regulate their osmolarity. This means that the fish salinity is 35%, which is the same as the environment that it lives in at 35%. As a result, they're ingesting salts with their food, water is being absorbed through the, the gills and skin, and salt is excreted through the urine. Osmoconformers, they're conforming to the environment that they're in. As a result, these sharks uh, do not move into areas with lower salinity, into brackish water because it would mess up their ability to exchange um, ions in water. Osmoconformers are conforming, 35% fish salinity, 35% salt water salinity. They're conforming to their environment. That term osmolarity, just so you have a definition for it, solute concentration of a solution, determines the movement of water across its cyclically permeable membrane. This is just referring to concentration of a solution. Types of osmoregulators, um, aquatic vertebrates, gills are chief organs for excretion, and cells, this is a carp. Kidneys are also evolved as osmoregulatory organs in fishes to remove water or conserve water. These are examples of a couple of kidneys. Putting this in a graphical form, if you're an osmoregulator versus a conformer. So if you're a strict regulator, okay, it does not matter the external conditions. Your internal conditions are going to be strictly regulate, regulated, meaning they're going to be the same. If you're a strict conformer, as the external environment increases, so does your internal environment. Now, an example of that would be salmon. Uh, they are strict, uh, as you see here, not conformers, are strict regulators. And in this case, this worm would be a strict conformer. So we flip back for a second. We see our regulators, they're regulating, they're maintaining that homeostasis. Conformers are just changing what the environment is. Perfect example here are salmon regulating and our worm conforming. Now, when they conform, this is organism X, which is labeled as a general organism, just because they are conformers does not mean they can live and survive at that entire scale. Here, this is the area where this organism can live. If that salinity of the external conditions gets too low, in this case, this would be the shark moving into brackish water, they could die, it's lethal. Or if it's too salty, they can also die. There's this area where they can live, too high and too low could be, lead to death. We're looking at aquatic organisms that are able to tolerate a wide range of salinities. Uh, we have our American shad and our American eel. They move between the ocean and rivers for spawning and reproduction. They spend part of their time in salt water and part in fresh water. Uh, migrating, some migrate to the sea, some migrate up the river. In the Connecticut River here, um, salmon 
uh, can come up the river, but we don't have a lot of salmon. We, uh, every once in a while, a couple come up, but we really have shad. So shad kind of do the same thing that salmon do. They live most of their time in the ocean, and they spawn in rivers and freshwater systems. They migrate up by the thousands up, up uh, the Connecticut River. Eagles are doing just the opposite. They spend most of their time feeding and growing in the river, and they're working their way down to the ocean to reproduce. So adronomous fish are the, like the American shad. They only spend a very short time in the river as they're coming up to spawn. This shows that life cycle here. Here's an example of the Connecticut River and where things are going in estuaries and freshwater and where they're living and migrating to. In the springtime, eels are working their way down south here to where the ocean water is, where the salinity is higher, and salmon or American shad be working their way up the river here. Here's some examples. Um, convert saltwater adaptations to freshwater and vice versa, depending on the direction of the migration. In sea, they drink seawater and discharge salt through the gills. And in freshwater, they stop drinking and produce large volumes of dilute urine and the gills uptake salt. Not every fish can do this. This is a stress on the fish. This kind of shows where the um, American shad migrate up the Connecticut River. Uh, Rocky Hill would be approximately right about here. Middle Town's where it takes that little notch. So they can travel a very long way. Uh, here at the Holyoke Dam, they lift the shad over and they count them. That's about 80 miles here. And it can continue all the way up uh, through Massachusetts. Most spawn in the southern part of Massachusetts and in Connecticut waters. So how to reduce stress in a stressed fish? This is if you get one and you want to bring it home. You want to minimize the osmotic challenges by placing the fish in conditions that are isoosmotic. This could be um, to add salt to the fresh water when transporting fish. This dilutes salt for the same situation for marine species. And this little cartoon here shows you thought your life was stressed. This poor fish is really hoping no one pushes any of these buttons and the power is off to the circuit. Lastly, we want to think about more than just osmoregulation in fish. There's also temperature to consider. Temperature exhibits the greatest influence on fish affects their metabolism, their digestion, signals to reproduce. So if adding your fish to an aquarium or pond, be sure there's no temperature or salinity shock. And you increase the odds that fish is going to survive the next 12, 24 hours dramatically.